As we've previously covered in our video, What Was Hitler Like as a Child, Adolf Hitler had in some ways a rather nice childhood centering around an upper middle class lifestyle and all the opportunities and niceties that that entails. But on the other hand, he was regularly severely abused as a child by his alcoholic father who also regularly abused Hitler's mother. Needless to say, Hitler didn't exactly have the best role model for good healthy relationships. How's that gonna go? And it gets worse. For example, his father, Alois, seemingly lived by the work credo of every store show soccer of see a hole, fill a hole when it came to women, whether he was in a relationship already or not. For example, Hitler's mother Clara was not only his father's third marriage, but became his father's mistress while still married to the second wife and possibly before when he was married to his first wife. Just to give you a very brief synopsis on this one, Clara, who was Alois's niece or cousin, depending on who his father was, it isn't clear, was 16 when she found herself working for Alois when he was still married to his first wife. Later, she was fired when his future second wife but current mistress demanded he get rid of the servant girl owing to her jealousy of her. However, once wife number two got sick with tuberculosis, Clara was rehired as a housekeeper and caretaker for Alois and wife number two's children. At this point, and as noted possibly before, Alois was apparently like, don't mind if I do, and began sleeping with his niece slash cousin who got pregnant with the couple's first child, Gustav, right around when wife number two died. Alois could have made a fortune on reality television. From all this, it may not be a total surprise that Hitler's later love life was reportedly a little bit abnormal and not what anyone, even many in his day, would call healthy. And that brings us to the topic of today, Hitler's niece, Angela Gili Rabal, who for a couple of years there, he more or less kept virtually imprisoned in his home as his mistress and also had some rather interesting kinks tied up in all of that that quite disturbed her. And then suddenly, just after an allegedly he argument between the pair, Gili was writing a pleasant letter to a friend in Vienna about an upcoming get-together when she inexplicably stopped writing mid-word and shot herself with one of Hitler's guns. By all accounts, Hitler was out of town when she did this. But let's just say even reporters in the country at the time found the entire thing pretty suspicious and accused Hitler of murdering his niece or driving her to suicide with his behavior. So did the future Führer kill his beloved niece or was she just one of a string of Hitler's lovers? According to a report done by the predecessor to the CIA, six known women who suddenly decided they didn't want to continue breathing leading up to his last lover in Eva Braun who ended her life by his side. Well. Let's dive into it all, shall we? Just before we go back to Simon, in today's video are two of your favorite pastimes, fishing and staring at your phone. Because I don't mean to alarm everyone out there, but there is literally a free app for that. Today's sponsor, Fishing Clash, which combines both of these enjoyable activities all without having your fingers smell like fish and tackle in the aftermath. If only that could be said for all other entertainment activities. For those unfamiliar, Fishing Class is a free, realistic fishing game played by an astounding 80 million people in 171 countries. Available on iOS and Android, the game allows you to virtually fish all over the globe without stepping out of your door. Such a nice feature, there are literally people out there after all. I really don't recommend it. And don't even get us started with that glowing orb in the sky bent on killing us all with its deadly cancer rays and its inevitable expansion into a red giant, at which point it will likely finish the job, be consuming the Earth and all of us on it as has been its goal since the dawn of the solar system. This all may be six billion years away, but it's coming and there is nothing we can do to stop it. In the meantime, to help distract yourself from thoughts of the inevitable demise of the Earth and the boiling off of all its beautiful surface waters, Fishing Clash offers tons of gear options for a variety of environments and types of fishing, as well as head-to-head -head competitions. And you can even create your own clan and play and compete with friends and family anywhere, anytime. Or forget friends and family, challenge your mortal enemy to go head-to-head, -head, allowing you to assert dominance via crushing them with your fishing mastery. And after you've thrown down your enemy and smote his ruin upon the beaches of the game, the depths of their failure, combined with basking in your radiance, hopefully will ensure their self-esteem never recovers and they forever rue the day they deign to do what they did to elicit your glorious fishing wrath. Speaking of mastery, Fishing Class has also partnered with Major League Fishing to help bring together fans of fishing from both the real and vastly superior virtual worlds in a variety of ways, including the Fishing Clash Angler of the Year Awards. If all of this sounds enjoyable to you, go check out Fishing Clash for free at the link below. And if you want to help support our channel and get $20 worth of rewards also for free, be sure and use our promo code today I found out. Now back to Simon and today's video. 
First, perhaps important to point out here, was that in his teen years, Hitler allegedly was determined that if the women he loved couldn't or wouldn't be with him, both he and she should go all Romeo and Juliet and kill themselves. On this one, enter his first crush one, Stephanie Isaac. With his rather obsessive relationship, well, relationship that existed in his head anyway, described in detail in his best friend growing up, August Kubizek's The Young Hitler I Knew, which was published in 1955. In it, Kubizek states Hitler developed an extreme four-year-long juvenile obsession with Stephanie, who he never seems to have bothered to talk to in person. Kubizek claims Hitler first became infatuated with her when he was 16. Adolf gripped my arm and asked me excitedly what I thought of that slim blonde girl walking along arm in arm with her mother. You must know, I'm in love with her. Hitler then took to standing near a bridge that she would cross over most days around 5 p.m. As to why he never bothered to go and talk to her, Kubizek says it would have been improper to address Stephanie as neither of us had been introduced to the young lady. A glance had to take the place of a greeting. From then on, Adolf did not take his eyes off Stephanie. In that moment, he was changed, no longer his own self. Or at least that seems to have been Hitler's excuse for not talking to her, because other men seem to have had no issue flirting with the girl, much to Hitler's chagrin. Kubizek states, There was a lot of flirting, and the young army officers were particularly good at it. Poor, pallid youngsters like Adolf naturally cannot compete with these lieutenants in their smart uniforms. It annoyed him intensely that Stephanie mixed with such idlers who, he insisted, wore corsets and used scent. Nevertheless, despite only occasionally exchanging glances, Kubizek insists Hitler felt the two were destined to be together. As Hitler claimed, for such extraordinary human beings as himself and Stephanie, there was no need for the usual communication by word of mouth. Extraordinary human beings would understand each other by intuition. As many a love struck teen does, he also began to invent all manner of things about her to fit his personal ideal, including that she was likely an exceptional opera singer, something he admired greatly. When Kubizek once told Hitler he couldn't really possibly know anything about her at all, he states Hitler exploded on him, yelling, You simply don't understand because you can't understand the true meaning of extraordinary love. Further, when something he learned of her directly contradicted something he believed about her, he simply would come up with workarounds. For example, Hitler loathed dancing and felt that she must hate it too. But when the pair learned that Stephanie danced, Hitler excused the notion, saying, Stephanie only dances because she is forced to by society, on which she unfortunately depends. Once she is my wife, she won't have the slightest desire to dance. Not letting this one go, Kubizek states he then teased that Hitler should take up dance lessons so that he could dance with Stephanie, to which Hitler purportedly doubled down on his previous sentiment, No, no, never. I shall never dance. Do you understand? Once Stephanie is my wife, she won't have the slightest desire to dance. As for his hatred of dancing, he states, Visualize a crowded ballroom and imagine you are deaf. You can't hear the music to which these people are moving, and then take a look at their senseless progress, which leads nowhere. Aren't these people raving mad? Apparently becoming impatient with the whole affair, Kubizek also claims Hitler at one point planned out an elaborate kidnapping, quoting, He hit upon a crazy idea. He seriously considered kidnapping Stephanie. He expounded his plan to me in all its details and assigned me to my role. I had to keep the mother engaged in conversation while he sees the girl. All right, going back to the whole Romeo and Juliet thing, Kubizek claims that Hitler told him that if he couldn't have Stephanie as his woman, he would jump into the river from the Danube Bridge and then it would be over and done with. But Stephanie would have to die with him. He insisted on that. Once more, a plan oh, was thought up in all its details. Every single phase of the horrifying tragedy was minutely described. Of course, owing to the fact that he never plucked up the courage to actually go talk to her, which likely would have been a severe disappointment to him had he done it, as she couldn't possibly live up to the ideas of her that he had in his head, nothing ever came of his first foray into love. Indeed, the only time he ever seemingly communicated with her at all uh, was a postcard that he sent her after he moved to Vienna. Stephanie apparently had no idea who the postcard was from at the time, but said he wrote, he was going to return and marry me, and that she should wait for him. In the end, she didn't wait for him and instead married one of those officers that had been flirting with her, and Hitler, whether he ever found out about this or not, never returned for her, presumably having grown out of his teenage infatuation at some point. Fast forwarding from there, the soon-to-be homeless Hitler didn't by any known accounts have much luck with the ladies, but as he and the Nazi party began their horrific rise, let's just say the growing influence and power of the man attracted women in droves despite his silly little moustache and that 
well, he was a very naughty boy. This was something Hitler was keen on keeping going, both the ladies of the nation attracted to him and his ridiculous moustache. With several of the women he was involved with claiming that he often had to say that he had no interest in marriage because he couldn't allow for anything to distract him from his mission and his life's work. He also allegedly stated that he felt he could exert more influence over the women of the nation if he was single. On top of this, he stated, The bad side of marriage is that it creates rights. In that case, it's far better to have a mistress. The burden is lightened, and everything is placed on the level of a gift. On top of that, he stated having children would be irresponsible of him, as it would divide his attention from where it should be in his work. And that, quoting, I'm aware that the children of a genius usually have a hard time in the world. They're expected to achieve the same stature as their famous father, and they're never forgiven if their achievement is only mediocre. Besides, they're usually cretins. This all brings us to 1925 and Obersalzberg, when the 36-year-old Hitler was in need of a housekeeper, so he invited his older half-sister Angela Rabal to take the job. As an interesting aside here, before working for Hitler, Angela worked as a cook for the Mensa Akademiker Judaica Association of Jewish Students. According to the alluded to famed 1943 OSS report, a psychological analysis of Adolf Hitler, his life and legend, written by psychoanalyst Walter C. Langer, while working at the boarding house, quote, some of our informants knew her during this time and report that in the student riots, Angela defended the Jewish students from attack and on several occasions beat the Aryan students away from the steps of the dining hall with a club. In any event, once Hitler hired his sister to run his household in 1925, she relocated and brought along with her a 17-year-old daughter, also named Angela, but called Geely, which is handy for not confusing everybody in this piece. Variously described by some as a young beauty, others claimed her charms lay elsewhere. For example, Hitler's British nephew, Patrick, who incidentally would serve in the US Navy during World War II, would state, Geely looks more like a child than a girl. You couldn't call her pretty exactly, but she did have great natural charm. She usually went with out a hat and wore very plain clothes, pleated skirts, and white blouses. No jewelry except a gold swastika given to her by Uncle Adolf, whom she called Uncle Alf. On the note of plainness, this seemingly would have been to Hitler's liking, as he famously had a particular distaste for things like makeup on cosmetics and similar things like that, with the Fuhrer even known to chastise women for wearing perfume or using hair dye. And as for fashion, when Hitler came to power, he established a German fashion board, Deutsches Moldamt, to help push his brand a very simple feminine in beauty, emphasizing, among other things, no makeup, natural hair, and slightly plump curvy women, rather than, to quote, boyish bodies that Parisian fashion promoted. Thus, his plain curvy niece was most definitely his cup of tea. And so it was that when in 1927 Hitler asked Angela to relocate to Berchtesgaden on the Bavarian Alps to manage his larger private residence, the Berghof Villa, he also requested Geely remain with him in his Munich apartment. It's not clear if Geely accepted of her own volition or was forced to accept by the domineering Adolf or her mother, or whether it was simply a practical measure given that during this time period she would study medicine at Ludwig Maximilian University. What is known is that for the ensuing four years, uncle and half-niece would live together in Munich, though they did maintain separate bedrooms for whatever that's worth. That said, it seems Hitler had other female love interests at the time. For example, around this exact time, he allegedly had a relationship with a teen girl by the name of Maria Reiter, who tried to kill herself in 1928 after Hitler refused to have her as anything more than a mistress, lest it distract him from his mission. Though she claims he told her if she would wait for his work to progress sufficiently, at some point he would marry her, and then proceeded to do as he seemingly did with every significant woman in his adult life, neglect the crap out of her completely until they killed themselves or at least attempted to do so. In Reiter's case, she claimed she hung herself, but her brother-in-law walked in as she was doing it and saved her life. Whatever the case, with all that, Hitler seemingly had immediate great affection for Geely, and his close confidant and then SA chief of staff Otto Wagner claims Hitler told him, I can sit next to young women who leave me completely cold. I feel nothing or they actually irritate me. But a girl like the little Hoffman or Geely, with them I become cheerful and bright, and if I have listened for an hour to their perhaps silly chatter, or if I have only to sit next to them, then I am free of all weariness and listlessness, I can go back to work refreshed. And do note here, the Hoffman cited here was one Henriette Hoffman, daughter of his official photographer Heinrich Hoffman, with Henriette and Geely quickly becoming close friends. Hitler's own close friend, Ernst Hamster Engel, who would later defect and work with US officials during World War II to profile various Nazi leaders, including Hitler, would chime in that he felt the services Geely was prepared to render had the effect of making him behave like a man in love. He hovered at her elbow with a moon calf look in his eyes in a very plausible imitation of adolescent infatuation. We'll get to those services 
in a bit. But for now, Henriette would also state that Geely was irresistibly charming. If Geely wanted to go swimming, it was more important to Hitler than the most important conference. Future head of the Hitler Youth, Balder von Schirach, stated of Hitler's public behavior towards Geely, Hitler followed her into millinery shops and watched patiently while she tried on all the hats and then decided on a beret. He sniffed at the sophisticated French perfume she inquired about at a shop on the Theaternerstrasse, and if she didn't find what she wanted in a shop, he trotted after her like a patient lamb. She exercised the sweet tyranny of youth, and he liked it. He was a more cheerful, happier person. On this note of Hitler liking them young, and basically every woman he was alleged or proved to have been involved with was usually around half his age, Hitler stated, a girl of 18 to 20 is as malleable as wax. It should be possible for a man, whoever the chosen woman may be, to stamp his own imprint on her. That's all the woman asks for. He also allegedly liked slightly dim-witted women for similar reasons, as illustrated by his best friend Kubizek on why their friendship worked so well. Hitler did not like it when others would argue with him or give their thoughts. Kubizek stated, he had to speak and needed someone to listen to him. All he wanted from me was one thing, agreement. As for Geely's side of things, one of Hitler's housekeepers, Annie Winter, stated, Geely loved Hitler. She was always running after him. Naturally, she wanted to become Frau Hitler. He was highly eligible, but she flirted with everybody. She was not a serious girl. He liked to show her off everywhere. He was proud of being seen in the company of such an attractive girl. He was convinced that in this way, he impressed his comrades in the party, whose wives or girlfriends nearly all looked like washerwomen. On that note of showing her off, von Schirach would describe the first time he saw Hitler bring Geely to an event, stating, The girl at Hitler's side was of medium size, well-developed, had dark, rather wavy hair, and lively brown eyes. A flush of embarrassment reddened the round face as she entered the room with him and sensed the surprise caused by his appearance. I, too, stared at her for a long time, not because she was pretty to look at, but because it was simply astonishing to see a young girl at Hitler's side when he appeared at a large gathering of people. He chatted animatedly to her, patted her hand, and scarcely paused long enough for her to say anything. Punctually at 11 o'clock, he stood up to leave the party with Geely, who had gradually become more animated. I had the impression Geely would have liked to stay longer. Things did not remain all peaches and cream, however. Geely complained to early Nazi party leader Otto Strausser, who was soon to be exiled after trying to wrestle party leadership away from Hitler and take it in a very different direction. Strausser states, During the 1931 Mardi Gras, Hitler allowed me to take Geely to a ball. Geely seemed to enjoy having for once escaped Hitler's supervision. On the way back, we took a walk through the English garden. Near the Chinese tower, Geely sat down on a bench and began to cry bitterly. Finally, she told me that Hitler loved her, but that she couldn't stand it anymore. His jealousy wasn't the worst thing. He demanded things from her that were simply disgusting. She had never dreamed that such things could happen. When I asked her to tell me, she described things I had previously encountered in my reading of Kraft Ewing's Psychopathia Sexualis when I was a student. He elaborates, Hitler made her undress, he would lie down on the floor, then she would have to squat over his face where he could examine her at close range, and this made him very excited. When the excitement reached its peak, he demanded that she urinate on him. Geely said the whole performance was extremely disgusting to her, and it gave her no gratification. SA officer Wilhelm Starker likewise stated, Geely admitted to me that at times Hitler made her do things in the privacy of her room that sickened her, but when I asked why she didn't refuse to do them, she just shrugged and said that she didn't want to lose him to some woman that would do what he wanted. She was a girl that needed attention and needed it often, and she definitely wanted to remain Hitler's favorite girlfriend. She was willing to do anything to retain that status. At the beginning of 1931, I think she was worried that there might be another woman in Hitler's life because she mentioned to me several times that her uncle didn't seem to be as interested in her as he once was. The aforementioned OSS report also claimed Hitler enjoyed being abused during his spicy time as well. For example, the report claims that German actress Renata Muller stated, oh, when she spent the night with him, Hitler laid on the floor and begged for her to kick him while he curled up into a ball and screamed how he deserved to be punished. Noteworthy, Muller was not long after undergoing treatment for an injury and drug addiction when she allegedly jumped out of the upper story window of her room, killing herself. That said, others claim Gestapo officers were seen entering the building just before this happened. And yet others, such as her sister, claim Muller simply fell accidentally owing to her alleged leg injury. 
However, as with so much to do with Hitler's love life and the women involved, it's impossible to determine the veracity of so many of these claims. Other than to note, for what it's worth, more than one individual directly involved on this one claimed Geely had told them the golden shower story. On top of Geely allegedly being uncomfortable with Hitler's kinks, he was also extremely controlling of her, with Heinrich Hoffmann claiming the pressure under which Geely lives is burdensome to her, and what makes matters worse is that she's prevented from saying how unhappy she feels. Certainly it flattered her that a serious and unapproachable uncle who was so good at hiding his feelings from everybody else was fond of her. She wouldn't have been a woman if she hadn't been flattered by Hitler's gallantry and generosity. But it seemed simply intolerable to this child of nature that he should want to mother her every step and that she shouldn't be allowed to speak to anyone without his knowledge. And then there was the jealousy, which seemingly went both ways. On the one hand, Geely was well aware Hitler had other ladies, and allegedly particularly loathed Eva Braun after Geely allegedly discovered a note from Braun that said, Dear Herr Hitler, thank you again for the wonderful invitation to the theatre. It was a memorable evening. I am most grateful to you for your kindness. I am counting the hours until I have the joy of another meeting. Yours, Eva. And on the other side, Hitler's jealousy with Geely was mixed. On the one hand, Hitler stated to Hoffman, I'm so concerned about Geely's future that I feel I have to watch over her. I love Geely and can marry her, but you know what my viewpoint is. I want to remain single, so I retain the right to exert an influence on her circle of friends until such a time as she finds the right man. What Geely sees as compulsion is simply prudence. I want to stop her from falling into the hands of someone unsuitable. But fall into other hands, Geely apparently did, and Hitler didn't seem to like that at all. The aforementioned SA officer, Wilhelm Stalker, who frequently guarded Hitler's home, stated, Many times when Hitler was away for several days at a political rally or tending to party matters in Berlin or elsewhere, Geely would associate with other men. I liked the girl myself, so I never told anyone what she did or where she went on these free nights. Hitler would have been furious if I had known that she was out with such men as a violin player from Augsburg or a ski instructor from Innsbruck. After she was satisfied that I wouldn't tell her uncle, and I had a personal reason for not telling him, she often confided in me. During all this, she apparently also began a relationship with Hitler's longtime companion and chauffeur, Emil Maurice, who, though he had some Jewish ancestry, was declared an honorary Aryan by Hitler in 1935. Maurice oh, would state of this that he was in love with Geely, and I decided to become engaged to Geely. She gladly accepted my proposal. Seemingly corroborating this, Henriette claims Geely told her of her preference of Maurice instead of Hitler, stating, Being loved is boring, but to love a man, you know to love him. That's what life is about. And when you can love and be loved at the same time, it's paradise. As to what Hitler thought of the relationship, he seemingly tried to separate the two, though not at first permanently. With Geely writing in a letter to Maurice on December 24, 1928, Uncle Adolf is insisting that we should wait two years. Think of it, Emil. Two whole years of only being able to kiss each other, now and then, and always having Uncle Adolf in charge. I can only give you my love and be unconditionally faithful to you. I love you so infinitely much. Uncle Adolf insists that I should go on with my studies. That said, two years later, Maurice O oh, was still out of the picture and had seemingly found other love interests on the side from her ever more famous uncle, as he apparently also had others on the side from her. This brings us to September 1931. From here in the story, accounts vary wildly as to the sequence of events that led to Geely's death. But what all agree on is that the now 23-year-old Geely wished to travel to Vienna. Why? Well, reasons abound. Everything from that she was pregnant with Hitler's child, to pregnant with a Jewish musician's child, to she wanted to go be with her Jewish lover, to simply that she wanted out and to have her freedom to do as she pleased, and that could never happen under her uncle's thumb. For whatever it's worth, Geely's mother Angela noted that she thought Geely wanted to leave because she was set on marrying a violinist from Linz, but that both herself and Hitler had forbidden the relationship. Whatever the case there, allegedly Hitler reversed agree to let her go, but later changed his mind. As to why, the stories once again abound. Some contemporary accounts claimed Nazi party officials were nervous about Geely being more or less set free to do and say what she wills, given that she was so intimately aware of so much of Hitler's private life and thoughts as well as some of their lives and goings on, so advised Hitler not to let her go. Others claimed that the rather mercurial Hitler became convinced the reason she wanted to go was to spend the time with another man, so changed his mind. Whatever the case there, household staff reported the two quarreled over the matter before Hitler finally left for a meeting in Nuremberg. With one account being she shouted out the window that she should be allowed to go, and the departing Hitler shouted back, NINE! Hitler then departed the home in a car with his photographer Hoffman, or at least Hoffman claims he was with Hitler in the car when they left, confirming that Hitler did in fact leave. Allegedly, Hitler then spent the night at the Deutsche Hof Hotel in Nuremberg. 
On that night of September the 18th, 1931, Geely was seemingly writing a letter to a friend in Vienna. As to who that friend was, the police report stated, the note said, When I come to Vienna, I hope very soon, we'll drive together to Semmering and... And then it suddenly stops mid-word. There are a variety of accounts of who discovered her body the next day. For example, in one, George Winter, husband of one of Hitler's household staff, found her, stating, when Geely wasn't answering their knocks, as the thing seemed to me rather suspicious, at 10 o'clock, I forced the double door open with a screwdriver. As I'd opened the door, I stepped into the room and found Rabel lying on the floor as a corpse. She'd shot herself. I can't give any reason why she should have shot herself. All that said, it would seem odd that no household staff heard the shot of the Wolfer 635 pistol. It should be further noted that the Nazi party leaders convened to discuss the issue before calling the authorities. Thus, whether the scene remained as it was, or if there was previously a suicide note, whether even that letter was written by Geely or any manner of such things is a matter of debate. Noteworthy on the letter is that the Nazi leaders initially seemingly wanted to frame it as a suicide, but quickly changed their minds to put that it was an accident. For example, Han Frostangel claims Balder von Schirach called the press office to issue a communique about Hitler having gone into deep mourning after the suicide of his niece. Then the group at the flat must have got into a panic because 25 minutes later, von Schirach was on the phone again asking if the communique had gone out and saying that the wording was wrong. They should announce that there had been a lamentable accident, but by then it was too late. The word was out. Thus, having the note finish mid-word and discussing a future event would lend credence to the accident angle. But as for how she got Hitler's gun, household staff would later report her taking the gun from Hitler's room about half an hour after he left earlier that day. As to why they didn't think this particularly odd, Hitler required that both Geely and Henriette be trained with various guns, including regularly practicing with them at a firing range so they could better protect themselves if need be. So her carrying such a gun to her room apparently wasn't totally unusual. As for Hitler, when he was in Formed of Geely's death, the aforementioned Ernst Hafstengel, who once again defected and worked with US officials profiling Nazi leaders, claims Hitler was in a state of hysteria and immediately left town, ultimately going into a depressive spiral, even foregoing going to Geely's funeral, though he would allegedly visit her grave a couple of days later. Hitler would also reportedly keep her room exactly as she left it, and on her birthday and the day of her death for some time after, having it decorated with flowers, as well as hanging several pictures of her at the Reich Chancellery in Berlin, including a portrait of her in his room. Rosa Mitterer, who worked for Hitler shortly after Geely's death, also reported, My sister and I shared a room that was directly over Hitler's. We could hear him crying. Rudolf Hess even claims Hitler became suicidal himself for a period after, although interestingly from the reports, it's not completely clear whether it was over Geely's death or the potential death of his career as a politician. Hess states, He was so fearfully vilified by this new campaign of lies that he wanted to make an end of everything. He could no longer look at a newspaper because this frightful filth was killing him. He wanted to give up politics and never again appear in public. Hess also claims at one point he had to take a gun away from Hitler, who was intimating that he was going to shoot himself with it. That said, Hitler's distress may not have been over his reputation and political ambitions, as Hitler's secretary, Christa Schroeder, also stated, After the death of his niece, Geely, Christmas was really a torture for him, and not pleasant for us either. It's true that he allowed a Christmas tree to be put in the corner of the hall, but Christmas carols were not sung. As a brief aside, Schroeder also claims Eva Braun used to frequently tell Hitler she would kill herself if he didn't spend more time with her and that, quote, when he no longer had much time for her because of the electioneering, she pursued him cunningly with suicide attempts. And of course, she succeeded, because as a politician, Hitler couldn't have survived a second suicide from someone so close to him. I say it again, the only woman he loved and would certainly have married later was his step-niece, Geely Rabol. And note, not just threatened suicide, Kate Haust, author of Nazi Women, would state, In November 1932, Eva Braun attempted suicide by shooting herself with her father's pistol, but she then rang Hitler's doctor, who came in time to save her, and the whole thing was hushed up. Hitler came to visit her with flowers at the clinic where she was recovering. Eva, the shadowy, loyal figure at the periphery of Hitler's life, continued to be frustrated by his neglect. Hitler would turn up at unpredictable times, and his moods shifted between gushing charm and indifference. In another case, Eva allegedly swallowed a bottle of sedative pills to attempt to kill herself, but nothing much came of this other than Hitler apparently begging for her forgiveness for the neglect and promised to do better in the future. 
Bitho writing in her journal on February the 18th, 1935, Dear God, please let them come true and let it happen in the near future. I am infinitely happy that he loves me so much and I pray that it may always remain so. I never want it to be my fault if one day he should cease to love me. But then pretty much right after that he went back to neglecting her completely with her writing on May the 28th. Is this the mad love he promised me when he doesn't send me a single comforting line in three months? His housekeeper, Annie Winter, sister of the aforementioned Rosa, uh, would also state Eva Braun was there often when Hitler was in Munich. She was always running after him, insisting on being alone with him. She was a most demanding woman. In any event, going back to Geely and Hitler's distress, it's often claimed that her death is part of the reason Hitler became a vegetarian, allegedly with meat reminding him of Geely's corpse. However, along with so many of the varied stories here, the veracity of this claim seems questionable given the majority of accounts, and including what is relatively known about Hitler's location during all of this, and it would never have given it a chance to see the body. Further, it really just seems like Hitler abhorred animal cruelty, and the Nazi regime bizarrely were among world leaders at the time in animal rights rights laws right down to banning boiling lobsters and crabs alive, limiting hunting and banning vivisection. They even held an international conference on animal welfare in 1934. Going back to the vivisection, Hermann Goering oh, would state in a speech in 1933, an absolute and permanent ban on vivisection is not only a necessary law to protect animals and to show sympathy with their pain, but it is also a law for humanity itself. I have therefore announced the immediate prohibition of vivisection and have made the practice a punishable offence. Until such a time as punishment is pronounced, the culprit shall be lodged in a concentration camp. Apparently, they were not only leading the world in animal rights, but also in irony. But in any event, given the pattern of behaviors here from Hitler with regards to animal welfare, it seems unlikely Geely's death had anything to do with his alleged choice of vegetarianism. He also had severe gastrointestinal issues that may have contributed to his dietary choices, and you can see our video, Hitler's flatulence defeated Nazi Germany, for more on that. And while that might seem like a really clickbait title, we assure you it's really not. It's accurate. But going back to Geely, after the matter was thoroughly discussed by Nazi party officials, the authorities were called and came to investigate the scene and, as alluded to, you better believe the media were all over it with the rising politician in Hitler's love life now thoroughly under the scrutiny of the press. The problem for getting to the bottom of it all is when politics are involved, the news media is generally fairly worthless at getting details right or even caring at all about that, generally just pushing their agenda rather than any semblance of accuracy. And things were no different back then. As for a small sampling of the news accounts, though, we have the Municher Neust Nachrichten stating, According to a police communique, a 23-year-old student fired a pistol aimed at the heart in a room of her flat in the Bogenhausen district. The unfortunate young woman, Angela Rabal, was the daughter of Adolf Hitler's half-sister, and she and her uncle lived on the same floor of a block of flats on Prinz Rengenplatz. On Friday afternoon, the owners of the flat heard a cry, but it did not occur to them that it came from their tenant's room. When there was no sign of life from this room in the course of the evening, the door was forced. Angela Rabal was found lying face down on the floor dead. Near her, on the sofa, was a small caliber Wolfer pistol. The Munich Post, an anti-Nazi newspaper, reported, A mysterious affair. Hitler's niece commits suicide. Regarding this mysterious affair, informed sources tell us that on Friday the 18th September, there was once again a violent quarrel between Herr Hitler and his niece. What was the reason? The vivacious 23-year-old music student Geely wanted to go to Vienna. She wanted to become engaged. Hitler was strongly opposed to this. The two of them had recurrent disagreements about it. After a violent scene, Hitler left his flat on the second floor of 16 Prince Regensplatz. The dead woman's nose was broken, and there were other serious injuries on the body. From a letter to a female friend living in Vienna, it is clear that Fraulein Geely had the firm intention of going to Vienna. The letter was never posted. Other papers picked up on the story with other accusations, including one from the Die Fanfare titled Hitler's Lover Commits Suicide, Bachelors and Homosexuals as Leaders of the Party, and alleging that Hitler's relationship with her took on forms which obviously the young woman was unable to bear. Hitler denied all such accounts of events, writing in response, It is untrue that I had either a recurrent disagreements or a violent quarrel with my niece Angela Rabel on Friday the 18th of September or previously. It is untrue that I was strongly opposed to my niece's traveling to Vienna. The truth is that I was never against the trip my niece had planned to Vienna. It is untrue that my niece wanted to become engaged in Vienna or that I had some objection to my niece's engagement. 
The truth is that my niece, tortured by anxiety about whether she really had the talent necessary for a public appearance, wanted to go to Vienna in order to have a new assessment of her voice by a qualified voice specialist. It is untrue that I left my flat on the 18th of December 1931 after a violent scene. The truth is that there was no kind of scene and no agitation of any kind when I left my flat on that day. One of the key journalists involved here was Conrad Haydn, who'd been on an almost decade-long campaign at this point to do everything in his power to vilify or discredit Hitler in the news, which one would have thought would be about the easiest job in the world because, well, he's Hitler. But whatever the case there, Haydn was the first to publicly claim Hitler and Rabel were having a sexual relationship, stating, one day parental relations to his niece Geely ceased to be parental. Geely was a beauty on the majestic side, simple in her thoughts and emotions, fascinating to many men, well aware of her electricity effect and delighting in it. Her uncle's affection, which in the end assumes the most serious form, seems like an echo of the many marriages among relatives in Hitler's ancestry in its borderline incestuousness. Noteworthy, Haydn was a member of the German Social Democrat Party, which was in stark opposition to the Nazi Party. Naturally, these and countless other accusations Haydn wrote about Hitler made Haydn's continued safety as Hitler gained power more and more questionable. And being not stupid, Haydn soon after his reports on Geely and Hitler fled to Switzerland. The point being of Haydn's accounts that historians are unsure of what is accurate in his and others' versions of events, and what was just Haydn and others seizing an opportunity to go after Hitler. Yet another similar journalist was anti Nazi editor of the Der Gerard Weg, Fritz Gerlich. Gerlich was working on the story and allegedly even had some proof that Hitler either had Geely killed or did it himself. However, Gerlich's known account includes claiming that Hitler had been drinking before he killed Geely, which calls into question his accuracy as Hitler had a pretty long and very adamant and public track record of being vehemently anti-alcohol. For example, Hitler wrote, I know what a devil alcohol is. It really was, via my father, the worst enemy of my youth. He would also write in Mein Kampf, seemingly referencing his father, it ends badly if the man goes his own way, and the woman, for the children's sake, opposes him. Then there is fighting and quarreling, and as the man grows estranged from his wife, he becomes more intimate with alcohol. He is drunk every Saturday, when at length he comes home on Sunday night, drunk and brutal, God have mercy, I have seen this in hundreds of instances. Whatever the case, unfortunately for Gerlich, on March the 9th, 1933, when he was allegedly uh, working on the story that was going to prove Hitler murdered her, Emil Morris, Max Amann, and a group of stormtroopers entered his office, ransacked it, and destroyed the files. Gerlich was then taken to Dachau and was ultimately killed there. However, given this occurred about a year and a half later, this also calls into question the often cited claim that Gerlich had such evidence Hitler had murdered Geely and was working on the story at the time. It seems more likely that it just simply pissed Hitler and other Nazi party members off on a number of occasions and they finally decided to do something about it. But as for the authorities' investigation, well, we can't really trust that at face value either, as the Nazi party definitely were exerting their influence on it. That said, there is evidence that Detective Saar, in charge of the case, was unhappy with the state of it when it was more or less closed by Minister of Justice in Bavaria and close friend to Hitler, Franz Guttner, sometimes referred to as Hitler's protector, and it was ruled suicide. However, what Saar found out during the second investigation has disappeared appeared from history because the records from it were either lost or destroyed. That said, the first report from Saar is still available, with Saar writing on September the 28th, 1931, his niece was a student of medicine. Then she didn't like that anymore, and she turned towards singing lessons. She should have been on the stage in a short time, but she didn't feel able enough. That's why she wanted further studies with a professor in Vienna. Hitler says that was okay with him, but only under the condition that her mother from Berchtesgaden accompany her to Vienna. When she said she didn't want this, he said he told her, then I'm against your Vienna plans. She was angry about this, but she wasn't very nervous or excited, and she very calmly said goodbye to him when he went off on Friday afternoon. She had previously belonged to a society that had seances where tables moved, and she had said to Hitler that she had learned that one day she would die in a natural death. Hitler went on to add that she could have taken the pistol very easily because she knew where it was, where he kept his things. Her dying touches his emotions very deeply because she was the only one of his relatives who was close to him. And now, this must happen to him. Of course, this account was seemingly mostly derived from Hitler's explanation of events to Saar, calling even further question into the accuracy of it. As for any physician's account, the body was examined by a doctor, one Dr. Muller, then ultimately released to be buried in Vienna, with some suggesting taking the body to Austria was a move to make it more difficult to have it later exhumed for additional examination. Although for what it's worth, it was claimed by Henriette that it was Geely's mother Angela who was the one who requested her daughter be buried in Vienna. As to what the doctor had to say about 
about her body and the allegedly broken nose that was frequently reported in the papers, on the face, and especially on the nose, were to be found no wounds connecting with the bleeding of any kind. Nothing was to be found on the face except dark grayish death marks which had proceeded from the fact that Rabal expired with her face to the floor and remained in that position for about 17 to 18 hours. That the tip of the nose was pressed slightly flat is due entirely to her lying with her face on the floor for several hours. The extreme discoloration of the death marks in the face is probably to be explained by the fact that death was primarily consequent on suffocation following the shot in the lung. And speaking of suffocation, the bullet missed her heart and hit her lung. Her choice to try and shoot her heart also seemed odd to some, with one Ronald Heyman, author of Hitler and Geely, arguing of this and the exact position that she was found in, saying, this means that if she was standing or sitting when the shot was fired, the barrel of the pistol was pointing downwards, since the hand holding it was higher than her heart. Even if she was lying on the couch or the floor, it would not have been easy for her to shoot herself in this way. And why should she want to? Having been taught how to use a Walther, she could, if she wanted to kill herself, easily have avoided such a slow and painful death. The aforementioned Otto Wagner would also give his opinion, thinking it wasn't suicide at all, but that, quote, the bullet's trajectory showed that she had the pistol in her left hand with the barrel towards her body. Since she was sitting at her desk and writing a totally innocent letter, which was unfinished, we must assume that it came into her head to fetch the pistol and check whether it was loaded, at which point it went off and hit her in the heart, an unfortunate accident. As for Geely's mother's thoughts, she more or less concurred, stating, I can't understand why she did it. Perhaps it was an accident and Geely killed herself while she was playing with the pistol, which she got from him, Hitler. Hitler's sister Paula had a different view. The only thing that keeps me from publicly accusing him is the memory of our mother. I would accuse him of the deliberate murder of Geely. And don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying he drove her to death, caused her to commit suicide, or anything like that. I mean to accuse him of shooting and killing her. I have enough proof to convince a fair jury that Adolf should be convicted of murder. As for Geely's best friend, Henry Ad, she states, Hitler fenced her life off so tightly, confined her in such a narrow space that she saw no other way out. Finally, she hated her uncle. She really wanted to kill him. She couldn't do that, so she killed herself, to hurt him deeply enough, to disturb him. She knew that nothing else would wound him so badly. And because he knew too, he was so desperate, he had to blame himself. For what it's worth, Paula and Henriette also claim Geely was not pregnant at the time, contrary to many of the rumors swirling. Another interesting thread in all of this is Father Johann Pant, who conducted Geely's funeral. Father Pant stated he could not have performed the Catholic funeral if Geely had committed suicide and that they pretended that she committed suicide. I should never have allowed a suicide to be buried in consecrated ground. From the fact that I gave her a Christian burial, you can draw conclusions which I cannot communicate to you. So. Did Hitler kill her? Given the number of extreme atrocities Hitler committed in his lifetime, making killing of a lover in a quarrel seem like child's play, many since have just gone ahead and assumed that he did in fact murder Geely. That said, Hitler by all accounts quite adored his niece, and as in his family tree, and slightly more common in general at the time, this wasn't quite as odd as it seems to us today, outside of those from Alabama, who may be currently wondering what all the fuss is about. Nor in some respects was his controlling behavior towards his female partner quite as abnormal, if slightly excessive, but still slightly more par for the course many relationships back then where the woman was completely subservient to the men in her life because well the past was the worst wasn't it in the end given the evidence we have today which granted relies mostly on the testimonies of the household staff it's generally thought hitler could not have killed her primarily because he really doesn't seem to have been around at the time at least again according to the household staff as well as heinrich hoffman his photographer who claims that hitler was in the car when they left as noted previously also as noted previously he claims hitler was at the Deutsche Hof Hotel in Nuremberg that night, a little over a hundred miles away. And the next morning, they were allegedly en route to Hamburg when a courier was dispatched to tell him of the news of his niece's death. All of this, however, relies on the testimony of those either in the employ of Hitler or part of the Nazi party, with one exception. There is a ticket Hitler and co. received from the town of Erbenhausen, about 40 miles away, for speeding through it back to Munich after Hitler found out. And seemingly, Hitler was in the car at the time. Although this ticket could have been fabricated by party members or supporters as well to give them a better alibi. And of course, this was all the next day and the distance not so great that Hitler couldn't have left when Hoffman said, but gone back to Munich that night. Although why he should return randomly to retake up the argument with Geely or perhaps randomly intentionally go and kill her doesn't really make any sense. 
Thus, most historians are willing to take on faith that Hitler really wasn't there at the time of Gili's death. Especially as, while household staff may have been lying about specific events at the time, certainly if Hitler had murdered her before leaving, his staff may have had more to say about it after Hitler's death, but none did. Nor did those periphery related make any such claims. For example, Hitler's staff apparently liked him, and at least one, the aforementioned Rosa, who granted came to work for him directly after Gili's death, claims there were no rumors among the staff of any impropriety there with Hitler regarding Gili's death. She also states that he was a charming man, someone who was only ever nice to me, a great boss to work for. You could say what you like, but he was a good man to us. She also stated about the only thing strictly required of her outside of her work duties was to have her and her sister attend church every Sunday as he felt it was good for them. Ultimately, in 1935, Rosa fell in love with one Joseph Amortz and wished to leave Hitler's employ, and he happily granted her request and congratulated her on a relationship. She concludes, I only met Hitler once more, on December the 10th, 1936, when Annie married Herbert Döring, manager of the Birkhoff. He came to the wedding and was nice to me, saying he missed me. In any event, Rosa was 15 when she started working for Hitler, but critically for the story at hand today is that her sister, the aforementioned Annie, had worked for Hitler for several years before that and lived in the house. But her sister seemingly made no mention of anything odd with regards to Gigi's death. Rosa simply states of the whole thing, She shot herself in September 1931, and I was told, as soon as I went to work for him, that he was not to be approached on the anniversary of that day. Of course, just because he seemingly couldn't have done the deed himself owing to not being there doesn't mean someone connected to him couldn't have done it, perhaps at Hitler's orders or maybe even without his knowledge. Especially given that if Gili really was going to leave, as mentioned, she knew an awful lot of very intimate things about the future Führer and those around him, which could have compromised his rise and the rise of the Nazi party. And as alluded to, there were rumors that many among the party were uncomfortable with Gili and Hitler's relationship for that reason. So it's always possible someone else killed her to ensure her silence, which may explain why she stopped writing the letter in question, mid-sentence if interrupted, assuming she was really writing that letter at the time and it wasn't planted after the fact. Given Hitler's apparent love of Gili, however, most historians land on the side of that if it was someone within the party who had her killed, it probably wasn't on Hitler's orders, but perhaps done behind his back for the good of the party. Then, of course, we have the fact that she may well have simply just committed suicide, as was the official ruling over the matter. And it may well have been that any suicide note was removed before the authorities were called so as not to reveal any intimate details about Hitler and her relationship publicly, which no doubt would have been referenced in such a letter. Or it's always possible she simply didn't bother to write such a suicide note. Whatever the case, as alluded to, if it really was a suicide, it's also been conjectured that the letter she was allegedly writing may have been planted there to attempt to make it look like an accident instead, as the party seemed to have wanted that story to be pushed. On that note, another possibility is that she was indeed just playing with the gun at the time, with her handling such weapons allegedly not being uncommon, and having it on her when Hitler was gone for extra protection may have simply been her norm. This would perhaps explain why she was shot in the chest instead of the much more quick and painless way of the head had it been suicide. Thus, again, some have conjectured that while writing the note with her right hand, she was idling playing with the gun in her left hand, which allegedly is the one she shot herself with, and it inadvertently went off. This could explain the pleasant and future tense nature of the letter and the lack of suicide notes. And it's even possible in this case that Hitler was telling the truth that he was not totally against her trip, just her going alone, which would explain why in the letter she seemed to think the trip to Vienna was happening. In the end, what is very clear about the entire matter is the official story had some plot holes, and those directly involved had some contradictions in their accounts. Further, by all accounts, Hitler does seem to have been devastated by the whole thing after, both because of Gili's death and because of how it was being portrayed in the media and threatening his career. With many of the papers who were politically opposed to Hitler, doing as all political reporters seemingly since the dawn of time have done, exaggerating or making crap up about their opposition, further muddying the waters on what exactly happened here for any investigation today. And that's where things stand today. So what do you think, dear viewer? Now with the entire tale, as it is known, revealed, did he do it or have it done? Was it someone in the Nazi party who had it done instead with or without Hitler's knowledge? Or did she actually just kill herself? Or was it a tragic accident and another of a long line of such showing why you should never treat a gun as a toy? 
Whatever your opinion there, I think we can all agree that as seemingly every woman Hitler hooked up with after this seems to have genuinely killed herself owing to the way Hitler treated them in alternating extreme affection with extreme neglect, Hitler was not just the worst human in general, but also apparently the worst boyfriend ever. And he also did seriously need to rethink that moustache, didn't he? It was just ridiculous. Thanks for watching. And once again, thanks to Fishing Clash for sponsoring this video. If fishing is your thing, please do check them out for free at the link below and be sure and use our promo code today I found out for $20 in free gear. Thanks for supporting our channel and thanks for watching.